In this video, I want to spend some time talking about the famous Japanese ninja, as you've all probably deduced from the title. There are, however, two problems with doing this. Problem number one is that ninja have a large presence in popular culture, not only in Japan, but also in the West, and probably the world more generally. I would imagine especially in South Korea and China due to the proximity of those countries to Japan, which has led to a proliferation of myths, half-truths, outright lies, and modern-day information which has been projected backward onto the past. Problem number two is that if a secret order of shadow warriors actually did exist, they very likely would not be too keen on manuals or some other form of text or information generally being known to anyone other than themselves. Now, this isn't to say that we don't have primary sources, we do have them, and they do come from the Sengoku period of Japanese history when ninja or something like them were supposed to have been running around, and they do mention ninja. The official history of the Muromachi Shogunate is an example of a text which does this, but they aren't many. We do have some other sources from the Edo period, when Japan was at peace under the Tokugawa, and they come in the form of quote-unquote ninja manuals, but many of them appear to have been written during the mid to late portion of that period, which has made many of them suspect. Because of this, I would strongly caution you to exercise extreme discretion when picking up any book about ninja at a general bookstore, or reading any blog post, or watching any YouTube video by any self-described ninja expert or ninja researcher. Without trying to step on anyone's toes, because they are active on YouTube and other places, actual historians of medieval Japan don't take them seriously, and they don't take them seriously for a reason. The only exception to this is a Japanese program of ninja studies established by several leading Japanese universities, but this is still very recent and it really has not produced that much information as of right now. That being said, I want to try and cut through all of the myths to the best of my ability, and because of that I'm drawing on the work of historians of the Sengoku period who have touched on the ninja, of which there is admittedly not much, although like we just mentioned, that's starting to change. So. War and State Building in Medieval Japan is a collection of essays written by experts on various topics in Japanese history, principally on the Sengoku period, but not exclusively. The sixth essay, Autonomy and War in the 16th Century Iga Region and the Birth of the Ninja Phenomenon, written by Pierre Soiri, a historian of the Japanese medieval period, essentially the 12th to the 15th centuries, although you could quibble with the dates, opens up by saying the following. Located east of Yamato, about 50 miles southeast of Kyoto, the old province of Iga covers a basin perfectly surrounded by mountains with summits towering from 1600 to 3200 feet. The main river crossing that province, the Nabarigawa, snakes down between impressive gorges. The region forms a circle about 50 miles north to south and from east to west. Just north of Iga lies the district of Koga, with a landscape of hills descending down to the Biwa Lake. Between Iga and Koga, there are mountains whose highest peaks can reach up to about 3,200 feet. Koga was historically a part of Omi province. Southwards of Iga, on the other side of the mountains that demarcate the border between Iga and Ise provinces, there lies a landscape of hills and plains that presently skirt the Kintetsu Railroad between Osaka and Matsuzaka. At the end of the medieval period, this very narrow stretch of country was a manor estate called the Oyamato Shoin. Many people during the Sengoku period engaged in acts of espionage and assassination, but really, if you want to talk about the Japanese ninja in any historical capacity, your focus essentially has to be on the regions of Iga and Koga, because many of those saboteurs and assassins and spies came from here. Not all of them, of course, but many of them. And if they're not called ninja in the primary sources, they are very often called the men of Iga. So what made this place so special? The first thing we should cover is the term ninja. What's the difference between that word and the other word for these people, shinobi? Essentially nothing. They're the same character, there are just two different ways of reading it. One is Chinese, this is ninja, and it means one who endures. And the other is Japanese, shinobi, and it means a person who endures. So functionally, they are pretty much the same thing. So with that out of the way, let's start talking about Iga and Koga. 
The majority of my audience is from America and other regions where English is the dominant language. So based on that, I would be willing to hazard a guess that many of you listening to this, unless you are really, really into Japanese history, you are probably familiar with Japan in this era, roughly the late 15th through the early 17th centuries, being described as feudal. While this is starting to change in the English language works, the Japanese language scholarship totally rejects the characterization. There was an attempt in the 1800s to make Japan seem like an Asian variant of Europe. So samurai were akin to knights, etc. It has its own long historiographical story, but contemporary historians don't do this anymore. A more accurate description for the social and political power structures for most of the Sengoku era was not feudal, but this other term, iki. During the last years of the Kamakura Shogunate, in the early 1300s, the country erupted into a war which lasted for decades. This was the war between the northern and southern courts when two rival branches of the imperial family fought for influence and control. This ends with the establishment of the Muromachi, or Ashikaga Shogunate, in the mid-1300s, and during all of this, the fighting increased, and in an attempt to establish more effective militaries, the Hanzei Edict was passed, allowing regions to keep more tax revenue, provided that tax revenue go to the military. Eventually, what happens is it allows local militaries to be created, but land stewards start keeping the taxes and they revolted, in other places, lower-ranking samurai rose up and killed their lords. In a word, local power structures broke down, and they did not really reconstitute themselves for the majority of the Ashikaga period. So then, how do you protect yourselves at the local level? The answer is that local communities formed iki, leagues, which saw villages, low-ranking samurai, who were so poor that they were functionally wealthy peasants, but had the lineage to be called samurai, and sometimes smaller landlords band together in mutual defense. This starts around about 1400 and really goes through the majority of the Sengoku period, up until about the 1560s, 1570s. These had constitutions of a sort, really we could do a whole video on them, but during the Sengoku period, Iki became the primary power structure at the local level, and they became so strong that very often they were able to challenge larger estates, monasteries, and the people who would eventually become the famous Sengoku daimyo for control and influence. Oftentimes, these iki were able to exert control over entire provinces. It's not uncommon to find in Japanese language works on the Sengoku period the term peasant republic or peasant's province or peasant kingdom. This is what that's referring to. The daimyo and the alterations of power structures to what we would understand to be a form of vassalage and land tenure does come but it is in the last third of the Sengoku period. For the first two thirds, roughly 1450-1460 to about 1550-1560-1570, depends where you want to draw the line and when you think the Sengoku period actually ends, the Iki was the dominant form of social organization. Iga and Koga are heavily mountainous areas, and they're densely forested. Even today, the area is less industrialized and less built up than the surrounding lands, and back during the Sengoku era, it was one of those areas you didn't really go to unless you had to, and it took a great deal of effort to actually penetrate the mountains and forests. A trip which ordinarily took two hours might possibly take a day. This is because, unlike in other parts of Japan, the land is covered with ravines, spurs, crags, fast-flowing streams, and provided those streams hit the right ravine or the right gorge at just the right area, they were turned into torrents, which were nearly impossible to cross. The paths in many of these areas were so narrow that only often one or two or three men could walk abreast, and really only one horse at a time, hence the name for those treacherous trails, the tiger's mouths. During the end of the Kamakura period, so the 1330s, 1340s, much of Japan was ravaged by gangs of bandits and uprooted peasants called Akuto, and they were active in Iga and Koga, and the residents very quickly understood that unless they worked together, there was no removing the Akuto, so the Iki of Iga and the Iki of Koga were born. The Oyamato Shoen, or state, was taken over by two groups working together and deriving authority from each other. 
The first was a group of 46 families of local warriors, Ji Samurai, Samurai of the Soil, who had authority over much of the military and judicial aspects of governance, but who governed with the consent of the second group, the local peasants, of whom there were at least 350. Taxes were kept within the community, violence among members was curtailed through threats of exile, and the Oyamato lands for all intents and purposes became autonomous. The Iga Iki we know a little less about. The League appears to have been formalized with the written constitution around 1560, but there were strong indications that it was in existence before, probably for at least a few decades, and in some ways it looks like an extension of the Oyamato system. And the Koga Iki dates from around the same time, growing out of pre-existing cooperative movements. Peasants had to work together to control water, tilling the soil, things like that, so it's not a huge jump to collective governance and mutual defense. The bulk of our information about Iga comes from just one text, the constitution of the Iki, which makes it exceedingly clear that the scale of the Iga Iki was essentially on the entire province eventually including the Oyamato estate on the edge of Iga, and that autonomy was predicated upon the cooperation of the two groups. The Ji Samurai trained the peasants in warfare and could bestow the title of Samurai on peasants who distinguished themselves, and the peasants, who knew the lay of the land, engaged in ambushes and assassinations of enemy military units and provided food through their farms. Much like a bundle of sticks, in which a single one is easily snapped, but a bundle is not, the Iga communities realized that there was strength in numbers. If they were to remain free during the chaos of the Sengoku period, they needed allies. So the Iga constitution stipulated that they reach out across provincial lines into Omi province and form an alliance with the Koga villages in that region of Omi, creating what Japanese historians call a Domyoso, a league of equal villages. In binding themselves together, the people of Oyamato estate, the province of Iga, in the villages of Koga, swore mutual defense, that they would rise and fall together, and thus they became Doshin, being of one mind, a common phrase found in Iki constitutions from this period. Around the 1560s, however, a new force was rising. Using a combination of firearms and pikes, both of which were deployed in large numbers, Oda Nobunaga was constructing a more professional military and organizing his province of Awari. He wasn't the only one to do this, I discussed it in a bit more detail in a trilogy of videos I did on the rise of the daimyo if you're interested, but what matters here is that Nobunaga attempted to conquer Iga and break the power of the Iki. In 1579, he sent his son against the people of Iga and his army was beaten back. But, two years later, in 1581, Oda Nobunaga returned and with an army of about 40,000, although some estimates place it at about 60,000, he set Iga on fire and after slaughtering an untold number of people, broke the back of the Iga Confederacy. The region was now under military occupation, and the people of Iga turned to guerrilla warfare, or rather, more of it, since they had already been engaging in that style of fighting. But, as it turns out, the people of Iga would have the last laugh. Oda Nobunaga was betrayed by one of his vassals, and he took his own life. In the aftermath of Nobunaga's death, one of his generals, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, united Japan, and when he died in 1598, the great lords of Japan, because by this point there were not really any Iki left, backed either Toyotomi loyalists or one of the other major daimyo, Tokugawa Ieyasu. The Tokugawa forces win the Battle of Sekigahara in October of 1600, and Japan fell under the power of that clan. The Tokugawa famously had a man who functioned as a retainer to them, Hattori Hanzo, and he has all sorts of legends surrounding him, and the Tokugawa famously had the men of Iga, or a portion of them, serve as their bodyguards for the better part of 200 years. With that said, this is where we leave the realm of we definitely know this happened, and we enter the realm of we maybe sort of think this is what happened. It's a part of Japanese history for which we really don't have all that much information. Due to the geography of Iga, the fighting which occurred often took the form of hit-and-run attacks, ambushes, etc. Anyone listening to this who hunts knows that that activity, depending on what you're hunting, often requires you to be still and not fall asleep for a while, potentially a few hours, in a limited area in order to catch your prey. Well, as it happens, 
that the skill set would lend itself nicely to something like assassination and guerrilla warfare. My point is that it's through the environment of Iga that the people living there develop the skill set which mark them out as agents adept in espionage, sabotage, assassination, all the typical ninja stuff you'll hear about. We have no evidence of any sort of ninja martial arts or ninja clans or anything of that sort from the Sengoku period. We do have the famous ninja manuals and supposed genealogies of ninja families from the 18th and 19th centuries, but those are documents which have to be read in the context of Japan, which was now at peace and which was often demilitarizing large segments of society. These texts are, more often than not, things which say, hey, we did this stuff 100 years ago or 200 years ago, we're still relevant, please give us work. They're questionable at best and some are just completely fictitious. If any sort of dedicated school of martial arts existed in Iga, we don't know about it before about the mid-1700s, which isn't surprising if a guild of assassins actually existed. This stands in stark contrast to other Japanese and really just East Asian martial arts in general, where you can trace back the history of each school and work through a genealogy of different masters and instructors to find out how those schools developed. Nevertheless, there are some sources which talk about the quote-unquote men of Iga being employed as saboteurs and spies, so we know that at the very least, spies were recruited from the province, but that doesn't necessarily mean that these were clans of ninja. They could be, and we just don't know about it, because once again, guild of assassins and secrecy and all of that, but it could also be that families of hunters and others who knew the lay of the land had skills which lent themselves to espionage work because of the manner in which they lived and the manner in which they had to conduct warfare. That's much more likely. You could make the argument that there may have been something because of some romanticized notion of a ninja tradition having a kernel of truth at its heart, but the thing with Japanese history is that it's full of traditions which have turned out to be inventions of later times and which have just been projected backward, like the idea of Bushido, for example. We do know, though, that Tokugawa Ieyasu had a penchant for employing ninja. The problem is that, like I just mentioned, the tradition thing as far as Japan is concerned is tough to deal with. Tokugawa originally wasn't the clan name, originally it was Matsudaira, and the clan was a vassal of the Imagawa. Well, in 1560, Oda Nobunaga's army defeats the army of Imagawa Yoshimoto at the Battle of Okehazuma, and Yoshimoto dies, and the Matsudaira chain sides to the Oda. In 1565, they take the name Tokugawa and they become masters of Mikawa province. This is where the ninja come in. Three years before that, in 1562, when the Matsudaira had pledged loyalty to the Oda, Ieyasu, or the man who eventually changes his name to Ieyasu, had a problem. Members of his family were still held hostage by the Imagawa in the capital of Sunpu, as they should have been since this was the standard action for a vassal to take with their lord to demonstrate some degree of trust. Well, they don't work for the Imagawa now, so the family is in trouble. Tokugawa forces laid siege to Kaminago Castle in 1562, an outpost of Imagawa power in Mikawa province. The original text for the siege, the Totaiki, states that the Tokugawa took the castle and exchanged the lord's sons for members of the Tokugawa family. However, a later source, not that much later, but enough, the Mikawa Morikotari, tells us that the Tokugawa took the castle by infiltration using spies. That source was written by a high-ranking vassal of the Tokugawa, and it sounded more interesting, so over about a hundred years or so, in later sources that talk about the taking of this castle, you can actually see the ninja legend evolve if you lay the sources out next to each other and read them line by line. Everyone in the Sengoku era used ninja. It was a job description more than anything else, and everyone used intelligence gathering and saboteurs, so it's entirely possible that the Tokugawa forces did indeed use ninja in attacking this castle. We certainly know that they were used later in Tokugawa operations. Indeed, it's likely that they were used here, but my point with this is that at some point, someone thought it was the men of Iga who did this, and the legend grows to such an extent that by 1700 or so, it was a full-on ninja attack, which became the traditional story of the siege. But if you go back to the original sources, it's not there. So that's just one example, but it's highly illustrative of the so-called ninja traditions which pop up during the Edo period, 
and even in the modern day, that there really must be something because tradition is not actually a reason and no trained historian is going to take that very seriously. It is something we need to be aware of when we investigate this topic in any capacity. The Tokugawa's actual documented use of ninja comes later, during the 1570s and the 1580s. We do know that they were used on the battlefield and during sieges by Tokugawa forces, the original documents do mention that. In 1582, as we've already mentioned, Nobunaga was betrayed and he commits seppuku. During the upheavals immediately following his death, Tokugawa Ieyasu gathered his forces and headed for Ise province in order to put down revolts and to take it for himself. In order to actually get there though, he has to pass through Iga province, the land where many of these specialists supposedly came from, and which had been devastated by Oda Nobunaga. And Ieyasu takes one of his retainers with him, a man about whom all sorts of legends have grown up and whom I have already mentioned, Hattori Hanzo. Hanzo, while he was born in Mikawa province, had a connection to Iga, that's where his father was born. We don't know if he made frequent trips to Iga like the Wikipedia page says he did, but we do know that he was not a ninja. That is, once again, an invented tradition about the Hattori that seems to come later. He was a samurai. While the Tokugawa were in Iga, all we know is that Hanzo asked the people of Iga to protect Ieyasu. It's possible that Hanzo maintained some sort of connection with his ancestral home and had contacts there, but we just don't know. What we do know is that Ieyasu employed people hailing from Iga province, so it's possible that Tokugawa had developed close ties to Iga, or maybe not. After the establishment of the Edo Shogunate, when the Tokugawa were in control of Japan, Hattori Hanzo did bring several families from Iga to Edo, modern day Tokyo, and they did form a core of the Tokugawa bodyguard, about 200 of them. Some of them act as gunners to guard one of the gates to the Shogunal Palace, and we do know that some people from Iga worked as Mitsuke, a network of informants and centers in the Tokugawa government. Not quite secret police, but something akin to it. But this doesn't necessarily mean that any of these people were hailing from supposed ninja clans. Now that we've actually hit the Edo period, I want to wrap up this video by talking about the ninja in Edo popular culture. Japan under the Tokugawa is usually called the Great Peace or the Era of the Great Peace. It was a time when, excluding some small peasant uprisings, there really wasn't any sort of organized violence like there was during the Sengoku period. The general structure of society was reworked. Samurai were largely taken off the land and made to live in castle towns, which often grew into large cities. This is not every samurai, however, there are portions of Japan where this doesn't happen, and the distinction between samurai and commoner becomes strictly enforced. Every daimyo had to participate in the Sankin Kotai system, basically a portion of your family is forced to live in Edo year-round, and the daimyo maintain a residence there, and they have to spend one year in their own territory and one in Edo. The exception to this rule are the daimyo of Mito, which we'll talk about in another video, but what matters for our discussion here is that the daimyo and their entourage had to use a highway system to get there, and they had to pass towns. Well, the thing about government-implemented infrastructure like this is that the common people use it too, and merchants and other townsmen often traveled along these roads, leading to a massive growth not only in commerce, but in the general interconnectedness of Japan, which led to a form of popular culture. Part of that pop culture included kabuki theater, bunraku puppet shows, and, actually, literature. Tokugawa Japan had one of the most literate populations in the pre-industrial world due to a rudimentary education system. I've mentioned once or twice in this video that the Tokugawa period saw a general demilitarization of Japanese society, which makes sense considering that the country wasn't really at war anymore. There was one exception to this, the Shimabara Rebellion, which took place in 1637, and we do have some evidence of people from Iga taking part in the fighting, but the sources we have for the event state that they performed poorly in the field. This was the period when Guki Monogatari, war tales, starts showing up in increasing numbers. These were, essentially, written by warriors who had been demobilized, or by their descendants a few generations or so after, in an attempt to make themselves marketable to the daimyo. These have to be read as political documents, written to establish credentials for certain clans, and this is where many of the ninja manuals and ninja histories I mentioned earlier 
come from? There are mixes between training manuals, war tales, and histories, many of which concern the men of Iga, but it's possible, as with the history of the Tokugawa siege of Kaminogo Castle, to lay the sources out in chronological order and see the details altered and the legend actually grow. So that's a major part of how ninja tales enter the Japanese popular consciousness. The other way it enters the popular consciousness is through a kabuki theater. We don't have enough evidence for or against this, but the idea that ninja were all black very likely comes from the theater, where stagehands or characters meant to be invisible did and still do wear all black. Certainly this shows up in Edo period artwork, so it's possible that this is where the stereotype of the ninja clad in black comes from, if you really stop to think about it though, this is a horrible idea for an assassin. You would stand out immediately. It's much more likely that ninja during the Sengoku period wore local clothing, or dressed as farmers, since many of the people from Iga and Koga and other regions where people like this came from were peasants. If black clothing was used at all, it likely would have been used at night, although even then a mixture of blacks and blues would probably help you blend in more than just pure black but I'm not personally aware of any sources which directly tell us this. In 1745, Tokugawa Yoshimune dismissed the Iga from the shogunate intelligence and bodyguard units, replacing them with troops from the province of Ki, and thus ended the role of the men of Iga in Japan, but the legend of the ninja would continue to grow and live on to the modern day.